Welcome to the tuberculosis presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about tuberculosis here. Uh, it is still one of the oldest um, uh, known diseases to uh, man. And then that's why there's a picture of a mummy on this front page here. You see over there, uh, one of the alternate terms for tuberculosis is sort of an older term. It was also called consumption. And you can see over here on this mummy, look at the spine, right? You look at the spine. Uh, when you get up towards the thoracic vertebrae, right, you got the lumbar and then you get up towards the thoracic, it's just like emaciated and eaten away or destroyed. So that's why it used to be called consumption. It's something that would consume someone's body. They lose a ton of weight really fast. They sweat a lot. They have such a high metabolic rate with this bacterial infection. It's a really, really bad um, condition overall. Uh, and that's one of the things that you should be aware of. This is something that's pretty significant. If someone has active tuberculosis, uh, it can actually be uh, limit to your therapeutic options. Like let's say bronchoscopy. If someone has active tuberculosis, uh, bronchoscopy can expose everyone into the room to that um, bacteria. And that's one of the things that you have to be aware of. And this is a, a airborne droplet um, situation. So usually a lot of these patients, if they suspect tuberculosis, they're going to be put into a negative uh, airborne uh, negative pressure room that's going to help remove any of that stuff that's sort of in the air out of into the ambient environment overall so this can be a pretty significant thing so if someone suspects TB on a patient usually they're put in isolation until it's ruled out uh, so it's one of those situations where you want to make sure you contain it so it's not um, spreading overall so let's get into it so tuberculosis as I already said is one of the oldest known um, uh, Man, one of the oldest known diseases to man, and it raises uh, wide, one of the most widespread one in the world out there. Uh, and then even uh, back to the Stone Age, Egypt, Peru, it's been out there forever. Now, I'm not going to hold you accountable for knowing these, knowing these facts during a test, but uh, it's just something just to understand. It's been around for a long time, right? Uh, they called it tuberculosis uh, because it forms tubercles or little cavitations um, that that happen. And I have tons of pictures of those in this presentation. So it forms little cavities or little um, uh, encasations. During uh, autopsy, they would find these little things in there, and they these they would find these tubercles in there, and so that's why they called it tuberculosis, abnormal condition causing tubercles, right? Uh, the, usually they would, uh, initially it's chronic, it's a bacterial infection. I do need you to know it's a bacterial infection. I do need you to know it's a bacterial infection. I do need you to know it's a bacterial infection that affects the lungs, although it can go to almost any part of the body. Well, you just seen that mummy on the first slide, right? It can consume the entire body. It can go to the kidneys, go to the meninges of the brain. Um, so we'll see some pictures of the tubercles and some of the other organs as well besides the lungs. So usually it's called uh, primary tuberculosis. These are not synonyms. These are uh, classified as either primary, post-primary, or disseminated. And we'll talk about all three of those separately. So understand that there's three classifications. you got primary tuberculosis, post-primary, and then your third one would be disseminated. All right, so let's start with primary tuberculosis, right? So if you're making a flow chart, right, tuberculosis, then you have your three subcategories. That first subcategory is primary tuberculosis, right? Uh, under this one, this is usually the first exposure one, right? It's the primary, the first time they have it. Uh, it's called myco. Bacterium tuberculosis, it's a rod-shaped bacterium, and it has some acid-fast bacilli stains to show you as well. Uh, the myco can be a little um, confusing for some people with a little bit of microbiology there because it, it looks like a fungus on a microscope. So when I have a slide that shows that uh, down 
in this presentation, but you'll see that it, it looks like a fungal ball <laughs> when you're looking at it, and it can be a little confusing there, but it's a bacterium tuberculosis. Bacterium tuberculosis, right? It's a bacteria, right? It's not a fungus, it's a bacteria. Usually, it begins when you inhale the bacilli, and then they get into the respiratory zone. Now, remember, when you inhale, which part of your lungs are mostly open almost all the time, no matter what part of the respiratory cycle? I'm going to give you three options, your apices, the middle of your lungs, or the bases. If you said apices, you are absolutely correct. Because the rib cage moves mostly in the lower lobes, right? You got more movement in your lower lobes for your rib cages. You got less movement in your apical areas of your rib cage. That means that this area, because it has constant negative pressure in the apices, is going to stay open. Well, the path of least resistance is going to be where the area is already open, right? We don't have to overcome critical opening pressure or anything like that. So what areas of the lung do you think are most affected by mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? We're looking at the apices here, and so I got lots of pictures of that to go over with you. So remember, this is more of an apice type situation. Now it can spread, it can be disseminated throughout the whole lung tissue as well. But this is the area where it's usually going to first start to show those cavitation, those gone nodules. Right? Over a three to four week period, the lungs will inflame. So you got inflammation uh, similar to a pneumonia. So a person might think, oh, I have a walking pneumonia right now in a medical term. I might have a pneumonia going on and they might not think anything more of it. The capillaries in this area will start to dilate as a response to the inflammation, right? That's a normal response. Uh, but the capillaries will dilate and then the interstitium fills with fluid. These are all pneumonia responses, right? Inflammation, capillary response, fluid filling sounds exactly like pneumonia to begin with. That's why it's very similar to an acute pneumonia. The alveoli uh, tissue will start to swell, and then there's a bunch of fluid that's going to start building up in the alveoli. This sounds an awful lot like pneumonia, right? So, so far this is looking like pneumonia. Eventually they'll be filled with fluid, leukocytes, macrophages, this whole thing just gets filled in. And then this phase is where um, it, they should have, if you give them a PPD, that uh purified protein derivative skin test <laughs> um, where they put that little wheel um, of, of the PPD, they put it under the skin subcutaneously. It should be positive. It should be greater than 10 millimeters. So that's one of the things that you will be looking at here. Um, so that's one of the ways that they'll either rule out TB is by going ahead and giving them a PPD. But PPDs, remember, they take about three days. Well, AFB smears, which you have to do three consecutive days, usually in the morning, you have to get a sputum sample for them um, three consecutive days um, in the morning and send it for bacilli, acid fast bacilli, AFB smears, and all that stuff. So there's a couple ways, but they should be able to get a PPD almost right away. But it's going to take a time. But the PPD would show a uh, positive in the primary stage. Alterations that occur with tuberculosis. Now this is a little animation on the side here uh, just to show active tuberculosis versus latent active tuberculosis versus latent tuberculosis. So you can still test positive and we'll talk about this in a little bit. You can still test positive, right? Both of these people would have a positive PPD result. One of them has active, the other one is latent. So this one over here would be the latent. And this one over here would be active. Um, so when you're looking at this, the PPD, the skin test, uh, is not absolute in considering if this person's contagious or has an active infection. Some people could have exposure to the tuberculosis and have that latent form where they're not actually contagious or anything like that. So something we'll talk about going on, but that's what this animation is on the side here. 
Um, so unlike pneumonia, because remember we talked about this looks a lot like pneumonia initially, the lung tissue that surrounds the area is actually going to produce a granuloma, right? It's going to produce this little cavity that's going to be in the lungs. Now I'm going to show you those in some x-rays, some um, post-mortem uh, autopsy uh, organs. So you'll sort of see these little granulomas, these hard tuber seals, these gone nodules that show up mostly in the apices. And that's, remember, when we're looking at x-rays, if you do my technique, the A through I thing that I um, that I use, uh, then you're going to sort of start to notice these in the apices as part of that type of situation, that they might have had a tuber seal or granuloma form from a tuberculosis thing. Now, if you see a, a nodule or coin lesion in the apices, remember it could be a number of different things. It could be a tumor, it could be a gon nodule, it could be a number of different things. So it doesn't mean every time you see something in the apices, it's tuberculosis, right? Remember, an x-ray is only one part of a whole patient picture, right? Just one part. It could be a number of different things. Uh, these little granulomas will form a wall or encaseate the bacilli. So it's going to form a shield around it to stop it from spreading. So your lung tissue is literally like, I see you, I can't destroy you, but I can contain you. So it sees these little bacilli just hanging around in the tissue, right? I'm trying to draw a bacilli here if you haven't guessed. And then the tissue sees it and like, well, I can't destroy you, I've already tried to destroy you, so I'm going to stop you from spreading, so I'm gonna give you this little fence, right? I'm going to stop you from getting out of this little fenced off area so that way you can't keep spreading, right? So you're forming a tuber seal, you're forming that granuloma around there. So it's that little nutshell, it's trying to encaseate and stop it, right? Uh, and then usually this will involve the lymph nodes in the hyalur region, right? The, this is when you see what's called the GON complex, and so that's what we'll see here coming up. All right, so this is a picture I took from your book, of course. When you're looking at tuberculosis, uh, we talked about it being mostly in the APC. So if you see in letter A here, uh, this is an early primary infection. You see it starting off as just that little radi radio opaque density in that APC right there. So when you're looking at that, not too bad, not too widespread, we see it starting out. If you go to letter B, you see it start to form a cavitation, right? Um, this is where it caseates, it, it, it surrounds it. it, it fences that bacteria in. And this is the big primary lesion that will ultimately form, that will sort of stay with them, right? When you go down to letter C, letter C means this is where we're progressing, it's spreading and it's causing even more of these nodules, even more of these caseations, caseations uh, are forming. And so this is a sign of new infections or a new um, exposure has happened. And then uh, usually you're going to see some lesions start to form here as well. Notice the lymph tissue involvement uh, grows as you get from letter A to letter B to letter C, that lymph tissue that's surrounding the primary bronchi are involved as well. So this is a pretty widespread situation. When you get to letter D down here, this is a lot of destruction, just that holy moly destruction, right? Caused by tuberculosis. It just sort of consumes the tissue and just absolutely eats away at it. It's pretty extensive and it can cause a lot of severe damage. The great news with this, I know there's not great news, there's not any great news with this really, but something to consider is that your apices actually don't get a lot of blood flow. Remember, your bases get more blood flow. Uh, so when you're looking at this, uh, their oxygenation may not be affected too greatly. It will be affected, but remember, there's not as much blood flow because we're going uphill, right? The blood's got to pump to the apices more than the bases and so uh, there's a big VQ advantage of it attacking the apices as far as this is concerned. All right alterations we talked about it forming those caseations what makes it way different from uh, pneumonia. Uh, you have that tubercle that causes necrosis that eating away destruction of the tissue. 
um, and causes those granulomas, caseations, all that bad stuff that you're looking at there. Uh, usually, you're going to have a lot of macrophages and lymphocytes involved, giant form. Usually, this takes a while to form that tubercle. It takes a while to form that fence around that bacteria just to keep it from spreading, uh, keep it from going throughout the rest of it because the body cannot fight it uh, or kill it off completely. So that's going to just contain it so it can't get out. The function is to contain the bacilli, right? Thus preventing the spread to other organisms like your brain, your kidneys, all those high uh, blood flow organs, ultimately. Here is something to remember. That tubercle could break down over time, and especially if their immune system is depressed. So let's say they have some sort of, let's say they have the flu, right? Let's say they have some sort of major situation where they have an organ transplant and their immune system is depressed. Let's say they're on uh, rheumatoid arthritis drugs and it suppresses their immune system or something like that that will suppress that, then the TB, the, the TB that's encaseated in that tubercle, that cavitation that was created, this can then break down and let that bacteria out. And so they can get that sort of secondary infection, right? And so that's just something to be concerned. So when you guys, uh, if you guys still watch that thing called TV, uh, every once in a while you'll see commercials for drugs. They're like, do not take this, right? Do not take Humira if you if you ever had tuberculosis or something like that, right? So that's one of the things that they're talking about there is the potential for that caseation to break uh, down and allow that the, the rod-shaped bacteria out. Right, Con potentially uh, contagious at this stage. Most cases, bacilli are usually pretty well contained within the tubercles altogether. So unless there's something going on with the immune system, then we really shouldn't have to worry too much. Uh, this is a much better picture than what I can draw, but here you go. Here's what's going on. Like I said, this is just from your, your book, and this is looking at the GON complex. Uh, usually you have the, the parenchymal focus, which means it focuses in the respiratory zone, uh, most likely in your apices. That's why you see the GON complex in the apices there. Um, usually around the hilar area where there's more lymph tissue, right? And so this is something you'll catch in the A assessment of the x-ray as well as in the um, uh, H assessment as well, the hilar areas, right? Usually, you're going to see that granuloma or that caseation. Uh, that's just the cause from the eating away necrosis and then forming these giant cells to help keep it from getting out and spreading. And here you sort of see that bacilli is just cased in there, and then you see that central necrosis going on. Surrounded by lymphocytes, it's trying to keep it from spreading. All right, so we're still talking about primary tuberculosis. We're still on the TB flowchart. We went to primary. We'll do post-primary, right? So we're still in that primary flowchart uh, on the side there. Uh, usually you're going to see calcifications uh, slowly replace the tuber seal. Over time, that, that tuber seal that forms in the apices will start to calcify. That's just the body taking care of it as a long-term chronic thing. Uh, that's perfectly normal response for the body to do. Uh, usually this will cause lung tissue to react um, as a scar, right? It scars up that area, which means your lung compliance decreases. That means your um, ability to expand that area decreases. So you can also see some atelectasis with this as well. Usually uh, when you have the isolation, in the tuber seals, your body should have a little bit of immunity, right? And they might, and the bacilli will remain dormant, right? Notice that these don't die. They just remain dormant. They're just going to go night-night, right? They could be dormant for months, years, or for the rest of that person's life, hopefully for the rest of the person's life. So dormant TB is also called latent TB. And that's what I talked about in the animation on that previous slide, that latent TB or dormant TB. That person's not um, going to be infectious to other people. They can cough and it's not going to spread and be contagious to other people. 
right? So they don't feel sick. Uh, they won't have any TB related symptoms. That's sort of that latent TB that goes on. So you'll see that out there. So that's one of the things that we'll talk about there. They're still infected, but it's not active, right? It's just sort of post primary. It's, it's not active. It just means they've had it, right? Uh, so these people will still test positive on the, the PPD, right, the, the, the positive um, skin test will still be there. So one of the things that they have to do, and there's RTs that got exposed to TB back in the day, uh, and they can't take the PPD uh, um, skin test because they'll be positive. So every like five years or something like that, they have to go get an x-ray to show that it's not spread and that it's under control. Um, and then turn that in for those hospitals that do have to require their RTs or whoever to get the um, the TB testing done on a regular basis. That's something that they might have to do. So individuals that do have latent TB are not infectious. They don't spread it to others. It's encaseated. It's good to go. They're, they hopefully won't have to worry about it coming back unless they get immunocompromised or something like that. So now we're in post-primary. So we did TB, the TB. If you're doing the TB flow chart, we did the primary one over here. Now we're in post-primary, right? And then we'll do the third one later on. But now we're in the post-primary TB. Uh, this is reactivation or reinfection. So take a wild guess or secondary TB. What happened here? Uh, this is after the initial infection has been controlled. Uh, these things, like I said, can remain dormant for quite a long time. And so usually they'll, uh, they'll sometimes, <laughs> uh, usually have an infection stage, uh, that happens after that TB is reactivated when their immune system is suppressed or is depressed by something. So this is where you've had it in the past, that tuber seal breaks down. Try to draw the cell in here. I am not good at that. So something happens with the tuber seal, it breaks down. These bacteria decide to jailbreak and get out of there. And then now you have a, your post primary TB. So you've had it in the past. Something happens, that tuber seal, that granuloma, that anything that there breaks down, and then that TB is now active in your lungs, in your body again. Oh heaven. So uh, extra pulmonary or disseminated tuberculosis. Now this picture over here on the right of your screen has a picture of kidneys and these are kidneys that have had uh, disseminated or miliary, it's called miliary or disseminated. Uh, extra pulmonary is another term for it, right? So there's a lot of things for this, but that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing these sort of calcifications and nodules that show up when these things are disseminated and it's usually organs with high blood flow remember your kidneys require like 20 to 25 percent of your blood flow your brain requires a lot of blood flow so you're looking at areas of high blood flow right so this is where they they escape so let's say you had um secondary infection it escapes and now it's traveling to your other organs right so it's going through the bloodstream or the lymph system Right, and here's the thing, it can go into areas that have high tissue oxygen tension. So do you think your kidneys have high oxygen requirements? Absolutely, right? Do you think your meninges of your brain have high oxygen requirements? I hope so, right? So that's one of the things that you're looking at here is those areas of high oxygen. Oh, it loves those areas, those areas of high oxygen consumption. Uh, so this is where we're going to see it. it'll start usually in the lungs and then when it does disseminate, when it does spread into miliary, and I have a good picture of miliary where it's spread out um, like miliary seeds or extra pulmonary, which is what you see here. Same thing. Uh, they're going to go to these areas, usually the lymph nodes, the kidneys, long bones, long bones, uh, the genital tract, the brain, uh, meninges. Uh, you'll see it sort of spread out. And it, there's even uh, animals, I think there's even deer out there that have disseminated tuberculosis. So uh, it's not just a human thing. So here's a good picture of miliary. It looks like millet seeds, like that's where it gets to that term, 
miliary, right? It looks like little seeds are sort of scattered in there. So uh, if you went to the, if you did the chest X-ray evaluation um, lecture, uh, here you're going to see it looks almost like what we call GGOs, the ground glass opacities that you might see with ARDS. But these are just little seeds that are just sort of spread. It looks like seeds that are spread all over the place. And that's that bacilli just sort of spread out, affecting more than just the apices of the lungs. So it's just consuming tissue all over the place. And that's what you're seeing here. All right, so this is just an animation uh, like your book has where it talks about sort of that spread, how it can go into the lymphatic spread, uh, even into the pleural space, the area that surrounds the outside of the lung too. Uh, it can go to the respiratory zone, uh, and it can even go into the um, central lateral uh, parts of the lungs as well. So it gets very, very widespread. And then usually, like I said, your areas of high oxygen consumption would be your long bones that are creating pretty much blood, your kidneys, high oxygen requirement devices there, right? That's why renal function can be a very important part of critical care medicine because when their, their kidneys start to shut down, that's a sign of hypoxemia. That's a sign that their oxygen levels are just to the point where their organs aren't able to maintain function hardly at all. And so that's one of the reasons why I highly suggest if you're going to work critical care medicine, paying attention to renal function can be a good indicator of what's going on with their oxygenation status as well. Uh, so if their urine output starts to drop, um, their renal function, their um, BUN creatinine levels start to increase, those are all signs that their kidney is not functioning much anymore. And that could be because of hypoxemia, right? Whether they're shifted on their oxymoglobin curve or not right those are all things that we should look at is this patient in an acidosis of some sort that would cause that hypoxemia that would stop the kidneys from functioning one of the neatest things to uh, ever see out there we had patients that would be in renal failure and uh, we would have uh, the the medical team call and uh, I would go look at the patient and they'd be like oh their sats are dropping and I'd be like oh okay uh, what's happened since, you know, I was in the room last? And uh, they would say, oh, well, if their urine output's increasing, uh, so on and so forth. And I'd be like, oh, well, if their urine output is increasing or if their, their kidneys are getting healthier and starting to process stuff more, that means that they're coming back online again. They're starting to consume more oxygen because now they're getting healthier. And so that's one of the things I would see. I'd actually be kind of happy if I seen their renal production improve and their SATs would decrease because that's a sign their kidneys are coming back online again. So it's kind of a neat thing to see there when you're looking at stuff like that. Uh, just remember, kidney the, the tuberculosis can spread all over the place, especially in your pulmonary system, but uh, you can even have it in your intestines as well. So it's something that is not just a pulmonary disease. It can be very widespread. All right, so what makes... Uh, what's a risk factor for having TB? What makes someone more prone to having TB? Well, people that don't have good nourishment, uh, malnourished individuals, and that's one of the reasons why um, your countries that have sort of that poor socioeconomic situation uh, could have uh, more of an issue with tuberculosis as well. Uh, that's also me, uh, p individuals that are residentially impaired uh, that live out um, sort of in those areas have a higher chance of having that bacteria really affect them overall. Uh, usually uh, institutional housing, uh, high populated areas uh, are more prone to have it as well. That's just that whole spread of something that's very, very contagious, right? Overcrowding. Uh, that's why patients uh, that come from uh, the the jails or anything like that incarcerated individuals uh, they there is some thought of how incarcerate how close quartered incarcerated individuals can spread disease faster because of their their close quarters to each other right how close they are and so that's something you got to look at is the overcrowding conditions or or the conditions in which they're living in 
um, can usually uh, make them more prone to these types of infections. People that are immunosuppressed, we already talked about this. Uh, Post-organ transplant, people that are undergoing chemotherapy or cancer patients, right? HIV, uh, ind individuals that have a that are HIV positive, uh, it can lead to death on those HIV positive patients. So it's just sort of a something to be considerate about. Oh, what's this one down here? Alcohol abuse. Oh, there's many reasons for that one, but we do not have the time for this one really to go into depth with it. But uh, you have some risk factors for sure with it. Uh, so just something to be aware of. Uh, we would see people, uh, we had individuals that would come in from, I think it was the Adam, uh, not Adams County, Arapahoe County Jail, uh, and they would be uh, here and there, they would test positive for TB, and they'd be in the isolation rooms and stuff like that. So understand these are just risk factors. So these, if someone meets these risk factors, we might have to rule them out, if, especially if they have hemoptysis, night sweats, right, high fevers, things like that going on, then we might have to sort of rule out uh, TB until for, until it's confirmed uh, positive or negative. All right, so the big thing, if, you, if someone's suspected of having TB, is don't share the air. Uh, so one of the things that you'll do here is to put them in a negative pressure room. And I think I have an animation of that in a slide coming up. And the negative pressure room just sort of takes this, because remember, it's that aerosolized droplet um, bacteria that can sort of stay in the air for a while. And when we put them in the negative airflow room, it takes the, the room pressure and it just sort of creates a vacuum, a general vacuum, that's supposed to let the air sort of clear over time in that room. So it decreases the risk of infection to the rest of the hospital and so forth. So usually it's an aerosolized droplet that's produced by coughing, sneezing, laughing. And guess what the last key to do if these patients are short of breath? Here, go give them a nebulizer to help them breathe easier. What do you think you're doing to the air that they're breathing? You're aerosolizing the droplets that are in their respiratory tract. So that puts you at a high risk um, for getting uh, exposed to this. And as an RT, uh, yes, you have a higher risk of being exposed to this. Well, that's part of our, our, uh, our job, I guess. <laughs> unfortunately that's just something we're going to be at high risk for getting exposed to things like this here and there uh, so the idea here is to abide by the strict isolation procedures usually you're going to wear a papper uh, or n95 mask which hopefully you guys all know what a papper and an n95 is by now um, when you're going through this uh, the n95s you need to make sure that it's fitted and you usually do a fit test with the hospitals when you get hired on with them for N95s, uh, if you have a beard or anything like that, uh, then you can you always wear the papper. Now remember with the N95s, they're fitted to you at that curtain weight. So if you lose weight or gain weight, uh, your face structure sort of changes with how it's going to seal. So you just gotta be aware if you go up 10 pounds, down 10 pounds or more, you might have to get refitted for your TB mask size if you do N95. Now, papper, you just wear the papper. It doesn't matter what your face size is. Uh, and I was always a bigger fan of the papper, but that's just my preference. But um, the papper just sort of has that device that sort of clears the air, that little helmet that you wear. Uh, like Marty McFly from uh, Back to the Future 1 there. Uh, it sort of helps clear the air, and so that way you don't have to worry about having a great seal uh, like you do with the N95. So remember, it can stay uh, suspended in the air for quite a while, so that's why we have to have that negative flow room. Um, <laughs> usually it also is, can be trapped in their mucus, so that's one of the things that uh, it can stay, uh, it can lead to a massive amount of contagious infection on a lot of people, because not only can it stay in the air for a while, it can stay in their mucus for a while, so they're hawking, they're spitting, right, poor uh, hygiene, and it can spread, right. Uh, usually, this smaller bacilli can go into the bronchioles and alveoli, ultimately, where it would then cause uh, an aerobic organism infection in you, right? Because these go to areas of high oxygen tension, right? <laughs> Which would be primary affecting the apices of the lungs, the top of the lungs. Looks like that would be a good question to remember, uh, where it affects the most the apices or bases. 
the emphases, right? Other ways you can get it is you could uh, uh, drink unpasteurized milk uh, that from cattle that have the TB. Uh, this is called Mycobacterium bovis, which is pretty interesting. Bovis, like bovine, right, from the cow. Right, and so that's one of the things where you can get it uh, there. Uh, rare uh, include uh, you can get it through the skin as well. It's not usual that that would happen, but uh, it can be done as a laboratory accident as well. But most of the time, you're going to get it from a respiratory exposure, unlike the unpasteurized milk thing, unless that sort of becomes a new thing out there. I don't know. All right, so person comes in with tuberculosis, what would they look like? What would their bedside evaluation be? Sounds like a good recall question at the end of this lecture. What would their bedside evaluation? Well, uh, just like everything else, they're going to be breathing fast. The heart's going to be beating fast. They're going to have hypertension, cyanosis. Uh, so all this is a response to that sort of hypoxemia thing, right? The brain tells you breathe faster, breathe deeper. Your heart says beat faster. Uh, because you're hypoxic, right? You will see edema, like pedal edema, jugular venous distension. Uh, usually their coughing is just violent, strong, powerful coughs, right? Uh, here's the thing, their coughing is so powerful, you might see hemoptysis with these patients as well. And that's also a sign of uh, destruction or necrotic destruction with this pathophysiology. So hemoptysis is one of the cardinal signs or symptoms of tuberculosis. Uh, usually the low grade fever will happen, weight loss, they won't want to eat, uh, night sweats are gonna be a big thing, extreme fatigue. Um, they just feel like they have the flu, right? It's a massive flu thing where they feel like they got a pneumonia and then they got the flu on top of it, chest pain, Usually that's why it was called consumption. Their body will just start to waste away, uh, and that's why it was called consumption. It just sort of eats away at these people. Horrible. Uh, this patient that's in this stage where they're experiencing all these symptoms, very, very contagious, very contagious, right? Well, can they take care of themselves? Absolutely not. So that's where family uh, or people in close proximity that help take care of these people are also at risk of getting it, uh, pretty severe risk of getting it as well. Uh, tuber seals may rupture and allow the uh, infected to go through the pleural space. So this is just like that we talked about blebs with um, uh, emphysema where they have these little weak areas on the lung tissue with those little, little weak areas make a pleural space here uh, burst then air will go into the pleural space well same thing here if that tuber seal sort of ruptures right that's forming it could rupture and it can spread into the pleural space as well uh, so there's also complications you can get in the pleural space or here pleural friction rubs with these patients as well. Further things, if you were to do a diagnostic percussion, uh, it would be a dull note. Remember the lung tissue is getting thick, uh, consolidated, scar tissue-ish, right? Getting that dense, dull bass note type thing. It's not going to be a hollow drum-like sound. It's going to be the opposite. It's going to be a dull, flat uh, note if you're doing diagnostic chest percussion. Permanence to be increased because we have an increased density. Breath sounds are going to be bronchial, that deep tone, that bass sounds, because we have that massive inflammation that's going on, right? And that's going to create a deeper tone. Crackles and wheezes if you're listening to these patients' breath, breath sounds. Pleural friction rub, I already talked about that. Woo! Uh, and these patients, because remember, these two seals can rupture and go into the pleural space and affect the pleural and actually cause the pleural infection too. Uh, whispered pectoralically would be present because we have inflammation, right? Anything that increases density will increase whispered pectoralically. Uh, it will increase the chance of bronchial breath sounds. It'll increase uh, the dullness of the percussion note. It'll increase firmness. It'll increase resonance right there. 
Uh, common issues that you might see at the bedside, hemoptysis is going to be one of your cardinal signs and symptoms. Uh, it can cause a pneumothorax, so that's just something to be aware of. Usually this pneumothorax is A, the weakened tissue, and B, the violent coughing equal an internal, like that 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 pneumothorax that can happen with these patients. Uh, they can develop, ooh, what is this? Bronchiectasis. Oh, heavens. It seems like we've covered that one before. Uh, they're going to have a lot of pulmonary destruction, destruction, so that's where you might see hemoptysis and all this other stuff going on. Uh, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. Remember we talked about how uh, their immune system might be down or if they get a primary infection, if you already have inhaled fungi that are in your lungs, then the fungi get a chance to actually start growing and producing. So it's not TB giving them the aspergillosis, it's them having the aspergillosis show its head or to start to culture on a larger level because the immune system's not suppressing it anymore. It's focusing on something else. So that's when it decides to creep its head out of the hole and go crazy and start spreading. So they might have that aspergillosis that goes on as well, right? It's not the TB causing it, per se it's the t it's the fact that the tb is taking down their immune system so their their aspergillosis is now starting to show up so it can easily happen over time uh these patients will undergo mental deterioration now this is if it's untreated and all that stuff um they can cause a lot of mental deterioration even blindness and deafness and all these other things that can go on with it so it is a very consuming disorder overall so what would their x-ray show like so the big thing here is the chest x-ray may not show anything if it's in that primary stage yet right it takes a little while for those lesions to start to show up and so that's not going to be your definitive way to diagnose it initially it's something that you'll still get it'll still probably be an order that they'll um, use for these patients but they might not be able to see much in the x-ray yet that's why we do the skin test that's why we do the acid fast bacilli the afb smear right for three days in a row usually in the morning um if we do see it it's going to be those sharply defined opacities like you've seen on that uh x-ray that the miliary x-ray uh sort of the small sharp defined opacities that you'll see there it looks like ground glass opacities like an ards type situation uh, when you see the chest x-ray, hopefully um, they don't have this, but if they do have it, they might have those gone nodules start to appear. That means it's been going on for a little bit there. Uh, so a lot more opacity because remember, dense tissue is going to be more radio-opaque. You might see cavity formation, especially if they had it going on. Uh, pleural fusions, if it's gone into the pleural space especially. Remember, just like anything else, your body tries to flush whatever area is infected out, right? Your nose has a massive amount of allergens or pollens in it. It runs so that it flushes it out. You got something in your lungs, it's going to create a lot of mucus, so it flushes it out. You got something in your pleural space, well, your pleural space is going to create a lot of fluid, so it can sort of flush or dilute it out, right? So these patients also might have a pleural fusion pushing in on their lungs as well. Uh, over time, it can cause a cavitation or fibrosis, which is going to make their x-ray even more radio-opaque. Uh, and then ultimately, we might have to uh, look at uh, seeing retractions of segments or lobes. Uh, they might have to remove like their right upper lobe or remove their left upper lobe here uh, and then obviously because it causes such hypoxemia and remember when we talk about the hemodynamics the oxygenation slide where it goes over a cvp right uh, uh systemic vascular resistance wedge pressure all that stuff you're going to have an increase in all the right-sided heart pressures with anything pulmonary disease and so that's why you're seeing the oh, right side of the heart get enlarged or the core pulmonale likely to happen in severe cases because of the hypoxemia that vasoconstricts the pulmonary capillaries everything behind it is going to start to back pressure and fail right and that's why you see high right-sided heart pressures and that's where it can ultimately cause that core pulmonale all right so what are you seeing here so here's the the cavity reactivation showing in the left upper lobe so you see the arrows the purple arrows pointing to it um, so you see that pleural thickening going on as well 
uh, with this. So you have this turbocil, tubercil up there, this cavitation that formed, uh, and then the pleural thickening that happened around it, that calcification that happened around it. And then ultimately on the right here, you see that disseminated. So this is the, that GAN nodule, that that opaque gaunt, you see that radiolucent um, looks like a balloon in that one there right next to that pleural space. It looks like that is just spread out. And then on the right side here of your screen, you see the miliary tuberculosis, where just like nodulization, just all these little, um, looks like seeds uh, are just formed throughout the lung. It's like almost similar to the honeycombing pattern that we talked about before uh, and seen on CT scan. Very, very similar uh, in x-ray appearance, but not quite. This is more fine. Uh, and you could sort of see how it just looks like just that spread. Someone threw like little tiny seeds all over that x-ray. It's pretty crazy. All right, so PFT. So important note here. <laughs> if they have active tuberculosis, I think according to the American Thoracic Society, who sets the standard for pulmonary function testing, uh, I think it's actually contraindicated to do a pulmonary function test on someone with active tuberculosis. Latent is a whole separate thing, right? Because we don't want them to infect the equipment and then infect other people. So uh, this is done on people with latent or not active tuberculosis. So what would their PFT is? Well, we know their lung tissue is going to have lower compliance, right? This is a restrictive disease. And all the restrictive disease has have low lung compliance. Because remember, the lung tissue is dense, solid. It's not going to want to stretch very easily. So they'll have low compliance. So all your volumes, and this is restrictive. Remember, it's not one of your CBABCFs, so this is restrictive. So that means all your volumes will be low overall. Uh, your flow rates. So what do you notice about the flow rates? Your peak expiratory flow rate, unchanged, your 200 to 1200, your FEF 25 to 75, your FEF 50. Uh, now, notice it says normal or decreased. Uh, that's going to be sort of depending on how much lung function they do have, right? So their flows might be decreased if, they're, if they have a severe restriction going on. So that can actually indicate the level of restriction. Don't worry about that. Just think about the flows as being normal and the volumes as being low, and you should be okay. Now, what about their volumes and capacities? Uh, as far as that goes, uh, there's a pretty uniform thing going on here. Uh, decreased. So if we have to put one of these patients on a ventilator, would you use a normal tidal volume? You could, but remember their lung compliance is low. So if you use a normal tidal volume, usually we'll start with maybe around 6 mLs per kilo. Now it depends on the facility you you work at, but uh, usually we'll start there. Uh, some hospitals they might want you to start at like seven or eight mLs per kilo for their tidal volume. In this situation, we're gonna start on the lower end, um, which would be that six mLs per kilo, and we might have to go down from there because we don't wanna use too much pressure when we're ventilating their lungs, right? Because their compliance is low, it's gonna require a lot of pressure to open up that that stiff lung, right? It's a lot of pressure to get the alveoli to expand. And so if you use too much pressure, you can actually start to destroy tissue on top of their condition already. So if it's causing too much pressure to give them six mLs per kilo with a ventilator, then we're actually going to go down to five mLs per kilo. And then if that's still causing too much pressure, we'll go down to 4 mLs per kilogram, per ideal body weight, right? This is per ideal body weight. Um, so when we're looking at this, when you have to ventilate these patients, their volumes are low, so we're going to ventilate them. Because their disease condition says they have low volumes, we're going to use low volumes. If someone has high volumes, let's say emphysema, then we're going to use higher volumes. So that's just something to consider. Someone's baseline disease process when we're putting these people on a vent ventilation. Now, I won't have you guys sort of remember this from my class here, right? This is a mechanical ventilation concept. 
But I want you to sort of start to think about this, especially if we're using non-invasive ventilation on these patients. Would you want large tidal volumes out of this um, tuberculosis patient? No, that's not a good thing for them. It could actually be destructive, right? All right, ABG in tuberculosis. So we're looking at active tuberculosis, right? We're not talking about latent, someone that's healthy at baseline. We're talking about active tuberculosis. Uh, just like anything else, because of the cyanosis or the hypoxemia of the brain, it's going to tell your brain to breathe faster and deeper, which will present as a respiratory alkalosis, right? Mild to moderate hypoxemia, so nothing new there, right? Remember, cyanosis is the big cause of this blood gas, right? that you're going to be seeing with all these respiratory diseases. So if you get a blood gas on this patient and they're in alkalosis, great. That just means it's early on. That's that's not a great sign in another sense because usually they're hypoxic. So give them oxygen. <laughs> Please give oxygen if you see this hypoxemia thing going on, right? Uh, give them oxygen. That should help slow down their respiratory rate. That should take them out of their respiratory alkalosis. Hopefully that makes sense. Right, you see that uh, the respiratory rate starts to decrease. You see their work of breathing start to decrease as you give them oxygen. That's a sign that their hypoxemia is resolving. That means you're being therapeutic, right? Excessive tuberculosis with pulmonary fibrosis, they'll be in a compensated, AKA chronic, right? Remember chronic and compensated are synonyms here. Uh, respiratory acidosis. So they'll have that respiratory acidosis, but hopefully their kidneys are working really well. Those little guys, our friends from down south, are working really well producing extra bicarb uh, to help compensate for this thing. So that's one of the things that you'll see here. Usually they won't be in an acute uh, acidosis, respiratory acidosis, unless for some reason their body's been under this for a while and it started into that consumption type thing where their body's just shutting down and their muscles are not able to compensate anymore. All right, so this is where we talk about the heart pressures, right? The lungs. Right ventricle, left ventricle. All right, so we have the pulmonary artery, right ventricle, left ventricle, aorta, uh, and then let's just do the vena cava. All right, so this is an increase in your shunting. Remember, shunt by definition is perfusion without ventilation. Right, so you have perfusion, so you have blood going through the lungs that does not get exchanged with the alveolar gas, right? So this is an increase in the shunt process. Uh, your DO2 is decreased, not because of your cardiac output, but because of, if you're having a shunt, your CCO2 and CaO2, right? There's a big difference between there. You're not gonna be able to get much oxygen from the alveoli into the artery, or not the artery, the capillary, which then becomes arterial blood. Uh, and so your CaO2 is gonna be low. Remember the two factors of your, of your DO2 is your cardiac output uh, and your CO2. Well, your CO2 is gonna be decreased. All right, so therefore your DO2 is going to be decreased. Uh, your consumption, whew, here's the thing, your oxygen consumption, we just talked about this, and this is one of the ones that's an outlier, hashtag highlight point. <laughs> I don't know if that's an actual hashtag, um, but uh, you'll see that their oxygen consumption of their tissues can be increased, especially if it goes to disseminated. It goes to that where it affects the kidneys. It goes to where it's affecting a high fever, right? That bacterial infection goes throughout the rest of their body. That's where you might see an increase in their oxygen consumption, which means their O2ER might be increased not only because of the DO2, but also because our consumption has increased as well, right? Our metabolic rate has increased and therefore our O2ER is increased not only because DO2 is low, because CO2 is low, but also now because tissues are consuming even more oxygen than normal because there's a massive bacterial infection. 
so your O2 ER is going to be increased. Your venous saturation is going to be super low, right? Because your tissues are consuming at a high rate. So that venous saturation is something that we actually follow in things like sepsis and maybe something like this, if this patient's critical enough to look at it. We'll look at venous saturations and venous PO2s to sort of tell us about the metabolic rate. Is the metabolic rate getting worse? or better, right? So if I have sepsis and my metabolic rate is through the roof, let's say my venous saturation is 55, right? We draw it off the central venous line, right? Um, and so later on, let's say four hours later, we draw another venous blood gas and we get the saturation off that venous blood gas. And now let's say it's 50. Well, they're getting worse. They're consuming even more oxygen because there's less oxygen left over. Let's say five hours later, or four or five hours later after that one, we get another blood gas and their venous saturation is now at 60%. Hey, their venous saturation is increasing, which means their tissues are not consuming near as much oxygen, which is a sign that their infection is getting or trending better. I hope that makes sense to you. So there is important application to this, especially if you're working critical care medicine, this slide will be invaluable to you. I know right now it may still look great to you. That's why I like to draw on it. That's why I like to uh, go over it with each of these diseases. But if you work critical care medicine, this slide will mean so much to you. So let me ask you this, a uh, pulmonary condition, something like nitric oxide, which is a pulmonary vasodilator, could this help this patient have a better CaO2? Pulmonary vasodilator. Because remember, cyanosis is caused by pulmonary vasoconstriction. So if we pulmonary vasodilate, we'll be able to get more oxygen into the capillaries. Well, if we increase CaO2, that means DO2 will then be increased. So we're delivering more oxygen to the tissues. Is this a good thing to deliver more oxygen to the tissues? Yeah, absolutely. Because that means the tissues are less likely to go into an anaerobic metabolism. They're more likely to stay functioning. Our kidneys are less likely to get shut down. Okay, so I increase oxygen delivery to my tissues, which means my venous saturation improves which means my body is actually having a better chance to fight whatever infection is going on just by adding something like nitric oxide or a pulmonary vasodilator of some sort to this whole equation. We can really change the hemodynamics and oxygenation of the tissues. Isn't that crazy? All right, hopefully you guys will eventually appreciate this slide as much as I do. So this is a picture from your book. I purposely included this. This is what you'll be seeing uh, out there more commonly. And this is just a, a, a table of sort of that picture that I drew. So here, the CVP represents a right-sided heart pressure, right atrial pressure, which is the right side of the heart, pulmonary artery. This is mean pulmonary artery pressure. Anytime you see that line over it, that means mean. So that's the mean pulmonary artery pressure. So that represents the right side of the heart. Um, cardiac output, we'll say that's sort of the left side. Stroke volume, we'll say that's left side. Systemic vascular resistance, well, that's after the heart, so we'll just say left side for now. Pulmonary vascular resistance, we'll say that's the right side of the heart. Left ventricular stroke work index, which is the left side of the heart. Uh, right ventricular stroke work index, which is the right side of the heart. Cardiac index, um, this sort of looking at the squeeze and everything, we'll just say it's the left side of the heart. Uh, systemic vascular, uh, sorry, stroke volume index, we'll say is the left side of the heart. Hopefully you covered these in, in cardiac A&P. I hope you have. So when we're looking at this, right, what did I say would happen to the pulmonary capillaries and the right side of the heart pressures? Well, pulmonary capillaries are going to be hypoxic, they'll vasoconstrict, and cause all your right-sided heart pressures to increase. What do you notice? All your right-sided heart pressures here are increased. What do you notice about the left side? So the cardiac output, normal. Stroke volume, normal. Systemic vascular resistance, normal. Stroke volume, left ventricular stroke volume index, normal. Cardiac index, normal. S stroke volume index, normal, right? So all your right-sided heart pressures are going to be increased. So right-sided pressures are increased. Left-sided pressures, normal.
okay? Remember, this is usually secondary to hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's why oxygen is going to be a big thing here, and that's why things like nitrogen, uh, nitric oxide and oxygen are going to be helpful to help resolve these right-sided heart pressures, right? I'm teaching you how to be therapeutic with the physiology here. Whew, that's a lot to say, I know. All right, uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Remember, that's the left-sided heart thing. That's how much, how effective that left ventricle is pumping. So this picture here, this table here, you're going to see in your book. I don't want you to be freaked out by it. I want you to know what it's saying. It's saying your right-sided heart pressure is because of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, because of the pathophysiology. All your right-sided heart pressures are going to be increased. Your left-sided pressures, they're going to be normal. Okay, so you have a patient with tuberculosis. What might their lab test show? So this is where we might actually run some lab tests here. Remember, it's a bacteria, not a fungus. <laughs> not a fungus, right? That myco part can really mess a lot of people up, but remember, it's bacteria. Also, this is a speedable question. Just saying. A variety of non-stains can show up on an AFB smear, right? Uh, so that's one of the things that you might see there. Usually you need to differentiate between uh, tuberculosis from other acid fast organisms. Uh, usually we can also identify drug resistant bacilli um, with the culture, right? We can actually put different things against it to see what it's sensitive to. So that's why you might hear the term culture and sensitivity. When they take a sample for culture and sensitivity, they're trying to see also what drug is most effective against this thing that's growing, right? This grows very slowly, so that's some good news here. <laughs> it takes up to six weeks. For the colonies to uh, appear in the culture. So this is not something uh, that a culture is going to be very expedient. That's why they would do the AFB smear versus a culture uh, on these patients. So when it was first studied, it was given myco, that prefix, which makes people think it's fungal. It is not. It is bacteria. Please remember this. This could easily be a question that you see on a future document prior right tq which stands for test question uh so bacterium growing in agar is appeared as colonies with similar to fungal colonies i think the picture uh there's a picture of that here in this lecture as well uh so what are the lab tests that we might um do so we think this person possibly has tuberculosis we're going to put them in a negative airflow room that's this thing down here just to sort of show you uh, what how it's done, usually you'll have your outside corridor, and then you'll go into this room that's in between the patient's room and the outside area, and then that room is where you'll put on your your PPE. You'll close the door behind you. The patient's door will be closed, uh, and you'll put on all your PPE, your papper, your gown, all that good stuff. And then once you're properly uh, donned, <laughs> then you can go into the room and treat the patient. And then you'd go back into that room, uh, take off all your stuff, and then uh, once that's all done, then you would come back out. Um, so that's that negative flow room, just so you sort of have a general idea of what it's like. So if you see that while you're at clinicals, there you go. Um, so these patients, they might go ahead and give them a PPD and just see if they're positive, right? Just to see if they're positive uh, or not. Now remember, you could be positive and still have latent TB, so it's not the end-all be-all, but if it does show up, it could be active TB. Uh, usually we're going to do an AFB smear, right? AFB is going to be a lot faster than culturing it. That's why we do the AFB versus a culture. Remember, culture, it takes a long time to grow. Uh, so positive AFB sputum culture can be done, or AFB, right? those need to be switched, um, <laughs> not ABF, uh, AFB can be done as well, but it just takes a while before we would get those results, um, or here's the other kicker, we could do a positive quantiferon test, uh, this is going to be one of the other signs that we could easily see if they have active TB or not. This is the slide I was talking to you about from your, your book, this is a culture where it looks like myco. It looks like a fungal growth, the fungal ball that you might see there. Uh, if you ever look at aspergillosis, like Google image aspergillosis x-rays, you can literally see these like little fungal balls that are growing in lung tissue. So I know that's just fun to do, is look at x-rays, I guess. <laughs> 
Weird hobby, I know. Um, but that's what made it look like. That's why they called it mycobacterium tuberculosis. It looks like a fungal thing when it's cultured. But remember, it is a bacteria, not a fungal. All right, so diagnosing. Uh, usually, uh, these are the most frequent ones done. The TB test, uh, the skin uh, TB test. Uh, we put that PPD into the skin. We're going to look at the wheel after 48 to 72 hours. Uh, here's things that you need to know that are in bold, right? Uh, if it's less than five millimeters, right, when we're looking at the wheel, it's going to be considered negative, right? So it's normal to have a little bit of a wheel, but if it's under five millimeters, it's negative. Five to nine, it's suspicious, uh, and we might have to do uh, uh, a different test there. And then finally, if it's 10 millimeters or greater, this would be a good thing to remember. If it's 10 millimeters or greater, it's considered a positive result. Uh, usually that's one of the big things that they'll be looking at. We'll run AFB smears usually three days in a row in the morning. That'll be a lot faster than letting it culture. We'll look at the patient's chest x-ray to look for things like gone nodules or um, the fine ground glass looking stuff, right? Uh, and then finally we can also do a quantifieron test on these patients as well. So here's another slide from your book. Uh, so this is where they're looking at the acid fast staining, also known as the, begins with a Z, two words, the Z. Hill Nelson staining of the mycobacterium. Uh, so that's what you see here in letter A. Do uh, you see those rod shapes? Those are the tuberculosis. Uh, that's being highlighted there. In B on the right, you're seeing that acid fast stain of tuberculosis from sputum, uh, and they're going to look yellow on this one. So acid fast, so one's a sputum, and then the other one is just the uh, Z. Hill Nelson. So you're looking at sort of just how it will show up there. Uh, do you guys remember what dye they use for this? It's used as a treatment for methemoglobinemia. Don't let it make you blue. Methylene blue, right? That's one of the things that uh, methylene blue is used for the Z. Hill Nelson test. It's also used for methemoglobinemia that's given IV to help the, the hemoglobin go from being um, ferric back to being ferrous again, hopefully. All right, so diagnosis, this is just a... Uh, um, post-mortem picture here that you're seeing on the right uh, what a GON nodule will look like on an x-ray versus what it'll look like on autopsy there. Uh, x-ray is going to be pretty valuable in helping diagnose it uh, during the primary stage. Um, you might be able to see the GON nodules uh, on there as well. That's, that's where you're looking at your apices or in your lymphatic area, which is the hilar area. If you guys do the A through I technique, like what I was talking about in how I read and interpret x-rays, uh, that would be something you'd pick up in either the A or the H area there, right? Because you're making sure you're looking at all these different areas. All right, so this person has tuberculosis. How do we treat them? What is the path of, what is the clinical pathway of this person? So uh, pharmacology, we're going to do uh, these treatment protocols. Now this can change. They can either do a six month treatment or a nine month treatment. Um, they're going to use things like rifampin um, as well. And usually this patient uh, has to be compliant with these drugs. And that's one of the biggest issue out there is compliance. Uh, that's one of the reasons why these uh, more socioeconomically uh, opportunistic places that are out there, these patients may, may not be able to afford these or may just stop taking them. Just like they people do with antibiotics, they feel better, they stop taking it and it doesn't completely kill or take care of the issue. Um, I'm not going to hold you guys accountable for these drugs that's a big one for me to make you not accountable for. It's just a lot of stuff to remember here. Um, just understand there's a six month treatment protocol and a nine month treatment protocol. You should put this, right? You should put this 
on your your table, right? Your restrictive disease table when you're looking at tuberculosis. You should put the six month and a nine month treatment protocol here. Uh, rifampin sort of the big drug here. I might ask you to remember rifampin. That's the big one thing. Uh, it, this is a big deal uh, with people that are uh, HIV positive, uh, and it's been named uh, extensively drug resistance. TB is something that's out there as well. All right, don't you love my pictures? Uh, <laughs> therapeutic interventions. We talked about hypoxic um, pulmonary vasoconstriction. So oxygen therapy, oxygen is a pulmonary vasodilator that should help with the right-sided heart pressures. Uh, that should help with the oxygenation of the kidneys and so on and so forth. Airway clearance therapy, if they have a lot of uh, thick, remember this can cause bronchiectasis, right? That that um, part of that slide, the first part of this presentation, it can cause bronchiectasis. So airway clearance therapy as needed, non-invasive or mechanical ventilation as needed as well, can cause a lot of issues with respiratory, with breathing, um, but it can cause, they could eventually go into respiratory fatigue or failure, depending on their level of hypoxia um, and their ability to exchange gas, their ability to function, especially if the disease has sort of consumed a lot of their muscle function. Isolation, put them in isolation, that's that negative flow room. Respiratory isolation until their smears are negative. Then, uh, that, like I said, those AFB smears are taken over three consecutive days, usually in the mornings. Um, and then they could be taken out if they were all negative. All right, here's your review slides, right? These are for you to answer, not for me. What are some common lung alterations that occur with tuberculosis? If you were to see a tuberculosis patient, right, put your mental, mentally put on your Pima scrubs and your Pima stethoscope and you're, you're working in an emergency room somewhere around here or around the world, what might you see at the bedside? What would be some of their clinical presentations of tuberculosis? Anything abnormal about their cough, their sputum, high temperature, low temperature, no temperature, Hypertension, hypotension, tachypnea, tachycardia, bradypnea, bradycardia. What would their patient assessment be like? Would they have JVD, especially if their right side of heart pressures were high enough? Is there edema that goes along with this? Like putting edema? What are some of the things they might complain about? Night sweats? Being cold? Gaining weight, losing weight, right? What goes along with tuberculosis? What are some of the clinical things that you might see on their x-ray? What areas of the x-ray might be more effective? Um, what are your three common types? I know that's not a question on here. What are your three common categories of tuberculosis? Uh, ABG, if it's sort of in that acute, mild stage, or what if it's in that severe stage? What would their ABG be? Tell me about their hemodynamics. Tell me about their oxygenation. Tell me about what's going on with the right-sided heart pressures. Tell me what's going on with the left-sided heart pressures. If you were working in a pulmonary function lab and someone with latent TB came in, what would be their volumes and flow rates? Would both of them be low? Would their volumes be low? Would their flow rates be low? Would their volumes be high? Would their flow rates be high? Interesting. Anything abnormal about their sputum? Anything could be growing. What shape would it be? What would lab tests show? What are different lab tests used for tuberculosis? What wheel size would be indicative or of a positive test result? All right, this person's in front of you. They have TB. They're looking pretty bad. What are some initial interventions you're going to use to help to be therapeutic to help them avoid their TB symptoms from getting worse? What are some initial steps you're going to take?
airway clearance therapy for this person? Mechanical ventilation? Oxygen? Right, this is for you to sort of go through, make sure you sort of understand this person's in front of you, what what are they going to look like? What are some of the things that you're gonna do? How are you going to approach this type of patient population in general, right? Hopefully you're going through this, you're starting to get the application through all these things as we go.